righty, let's, uh, let's get started. Thank you again for joining us this morning. We appreciate you making some time as usual uh, for the user group and uh, look forward to your participation and hopefully many questions. So uh, let's jump right in and explore some consent management. So just some housekeeping or things to know. Um, most of you will, will be familiar with this, but yes, we do record the session. Um, replays will be available on our blog. Uh, there is a Q&A function we'd encourage you to use. So please try and use the Q&A function. If you do have a personal question, is there something you don't want everybody else to see, feel free to use the chat, but uh, the Q&A is visible to everybody on the webinar and you can actually upvote or add comments to those questions. That yep, covers housekeeping. All right, so who are we? So my name is Derek Bell, the Director for Customer Success and Marketing here at Marketing Cube. And I'm assisted today by Matt Hemsley, our Marketing Manager, and also Jason O'Donnell, our Account Director. So agenda for today, uh, welcome and introduction. We'll also cover off some of the attribution that we'd like to share with you each month on that one. We'll also look at consent management and specifically how that's managed by Eloqua. We'll then look at some specific ways that you might capture and hold and store and retrieve that data using email groups, forms, and probably custom objects as well, and understanding how you can keep that consent information captured. The Q&A is kind of live throughout, so please feel free to ask questions at any particular point. And as for the release information there, we're kind of right in the middle of no man's land at the moment. We've covered 21B twice already uh, over the last two months, and we don't have any insight yet into 21C, but uh, we'll jump to that when we get there. So there were some questions that were submitted this month. So first one is from Justin in Queensland. And Justin is looking at email groups and trying to understand how best to manage those in the context of multiple donors. So there's probably a few ways that you could do this, Justin, but the, um, the, the alarm bell for me uh, was, is it legal? for him to stay subscribed to other types of donors. So Justin, I'm gonna to have to refer you to your in-house counsel, but I can certainly provide some advice based on experience, but certainly when it comes to a question such as, is it legal? Then yeah, I would need you to have a chat with your in-house counsel and get some advice from them on that one. But let's have a look at what a solution might look like uh, for something like that. So. A different approach. So as you know, when you look at the electrical contact, you've got lots of fields. Uh, there's a whole bunch of system fields. From memory, I think there's about 80 or 90 system fields. And then there's about 250 custom fields. And those custom fields can be, as the word implies, anything that you kind of would want them to be. So if we look at your five types of donors, there'd be a couple of approaches, right? So one is you may have an email group that's called donor. Now, if you've in fact got five different types of donors, does that necessarily equate to five different types of communications? So when you look at the actual emails that are going out the door, is it that donor A only gets donor A comms? Uh, they never get donor B, C, D, or E, is that right? A, B, C, D, E, yeah, <laughs> those five. Could you align your communications to those different donor group? donor groups by a unique email group for each, each one. The alternative option is to have a email group subscription called donors and then store donor types potentially on the contact. The other thing that I'm not clear on though, I'd need to probably have a chat with you to understand this further, is this information stored in a CRM platform or a student management platform, or in fact, a fundraising platform? You know, what is the source of truth uh, that tells you that an individual is in fact a donor A, a donor B, or a donor C? So the question really comes down to understanding the profile better, then we can build out a, a model that best suits that particular environment. Now, if your objective is to be able to send people communications on specific topics and have them potentially unsubscribe from an individual topic versus they never want to hear from your organization again, then email groups might be a way to do that. But you also need to think carefully through that unsubscribe process, because the last thing you want is for people to click on unsubscribe, which from your point of view means they're unsubscribing 
from an email group, whereas they may perceive that they're unsubscribing or if we use the better language, opt out. They're opting out of all communications from your organization. However, next week, they receive another email from your organization and they're like, well, hang on a minute, I unsubscribed. I didn't want anything else. So we need to think through the customer experience or the donor experience and how you present those options to those people. So I'd encourage you to please jump in and have a look at the, we'll jump with the Q&A if you do have other questions on that one, Justin, or we can take it offline and, and have a chat a little bit further. Okay, insight and analytics. So this question comes from KCN in Sydney. And KCN's asking about, and this is where you need to have your smartphones ready, people. So get your smartphones ready. Can you please remind me the best way to automate the campaign overview analysis report and email analysis overview report, amongst others, so that we will automatically, so that will automatically go into our inbox rather than coming in and manually extracting them after campaign end date? Yeah, very good question, KCN. So essentially what you're after is what's called an agent. So if you go into Insight, what you need to do is create an agent and an agent in insight speak is a uh, a subscription essentially is what it is and so what it is you create a an agent and that agent will have a particular report attached to it and it will have a particular list of individuals who you want to have that report sent to them most commonly you would probably want to send them an excel file but there are options um, on the file format so you can do pdf or text in the email or other bits and pieces but i generally find the excel file file is usually the best way to do it and keeping in mind as well when you do create the agent that you do not have to the person you're sending it to doesn't have to be an Eloqua user or in the system at all you could send the report to your mother on a regular basis if you wanted to so uh, so an agent is what you're after so if you scan that QR code that's on the screen right now with your phone you'll reach a somewhat hidden page on our website uh, which has a whole range of insight resources for you and I think I've the code or the URL up, but it will take you straight down to the video section. And there's actually a video there you can watch. I think it goes for no more than three to five minutes and it will walk you through the process of creating an agent in Insight. But that's exactly what you're after. Uh, there are a couple of questions here. Let me just have a look at these. Okay, so a question from Mon. Let me just read this out. Um, as we're new to Eloqua, you don't have to apologize, Mon, um, but if we can't specify which link someone clicks on, at least we couldn't find how to do it, how can we specify that, that any link but unsubscribe? If they click on unsubscribe, they sure, then surely they should be removed from the flow. Okay, so let me start with the end of that question first. So yes, in the course of a, a flow, so if you have a, a campaign canvas, for example, that has you know, it's delivering 20 emails over eight months. If through the course of that campaign, an individual does unsubscribe, so let's be very specific in language, they globally unsubscribe, meaning they never want to hear from your organization ever again, then Eloqua simply won't allow them to progress. So that email that they unsubscribe from is the last one they'll ever get. Okay, so to answer your question, yes, the Eloqua doesn't remove them from the campaign. Um, you can configure it to remove them if you want to. Uh, Eloqua won't do it automatically, but they simply won't progress through the uh, through the campaign. Because remember, we know that if someone has globally unsubscribed, the Eloqua will never send them an email. It's as simple as that. Regardless of how many segments you put them in and how many campaigns you drop them into, Eloqua simply won't send them an email. Okay, so let's go back up to further point in your question. The, uh, the easiest way, there is a very specific report that you can pull in Insight that is a link breakdown report by email, and it will show you which links are being clicked on. Now, if you want to, when you're on the campaign canvas, let me show you actually, it's probably a little bit easier, a canvas. So when you're on the campaign canvas, you do have a question, which I'm sure you've seen a million times on the left-hand side, which is basically asking the question, has the person clicked on an email? If they have clicked on an email, so here it is right here. Let me just zoom in a bit there for you. So what this is asking is, has the person clicked on anything in the email? Now to Mon's point, it's possible, we know statistically it's fairly low, but it is obviously possible that someone would click on an unsubscribe link, 
Okay. So typically this is really helpful towards very top of funnel nurturing campaigns. So if you're really just looking for engagement at the top of the funnel, then this is really helpful because it shows you there's a degree of engagement that's occurring. Now, if they clicked on unsubscribe, again, statistically very low, but possible, then that's fine. Eloqua will take care of it anyway and simply won't allow them to progress. So that's not a problem. But if you want to be more specific, that's where you would use a shared filter. So if we look at an email, any particular email, and it may, let's say, has a primary call to action with a very specific URL. Well, in that case, what we can do is instead of using clicked email, let's get rid of that one, what we can do is use the shared filter. And the shared filter enables us to ask the question very specifically by a very specific URL, have they actually clicked on this link in the email? Okay, so that becomes a, a far more specific way to do things. So a shared filter mon could be a better way for you to go through that process. Okay, so Charlotte has a question. Uh, Hi Derek, how can we leverage the campaign canvas to capture a double opt-in from third-party event registration platforms? Sure, uh, Charlotte, this is something that different clients have done over the years. Um, I can't show you specifically how to do it on the campaign canvas because I have to go away and do some thinking because it's been so long since I've done it. But, um, but the answer to your question is yes, it can be done. And Charlotte, I imagine if you had a chat to Thomas, uh, he would certainly be able to assist you uh, with that one. But for the sake of the exercise, I may go away and, and uh, try and remember how to do that myself. But, um, but the answer is yes, so that's good news. All right, so if you didn't get that um, scan, um, I'll come back to that later if you need it. All right, attribution. We'd like to share with you a little bit of attribution, largely to show you what's possible, but just to give you a little bit of an idea uh, as to how, uh, how the campaign performed for us this month. So we had three invitations go out this month. First one went to everybody. Second email invitation went to those people who didn't open the first one. And the third one went to those people who opened the first one, but didn't register for the event. We also ran some uh, advertising on LinkedIn this month as well. So the first email is the winner at 67%. So that one certainly delivered the greatest result for us. The next one, the second email, Sarah, remember the second email goes to those people who didn't open the first one. So we picked up an additional 27% of registrants there. The third email, fairly consistent in relation to these percentages. Um, so again, the third email goes to people who opened the first email, but didn't register. So the language in that third email is a little bit different to the language in the second email. And then the last little slice of the pie is from a LinkedIn campaign that we ran. Very, very you can imagine, a very targeted uh, LinkedIn campaign. So what is consent management? And we're looking at this strictly from an Eloqua perspective. Consent management, did some scouring to try and find a nice succinct definition. And these guys at Bloomreach, I thought came up with a fairly nice uh, succinct definition. But it's a, a system or processes and uh, something like Eloqua or any sort of uh, technology lends itself to being a system or a process whereby customers are able to determine what personal data they are willing to share with the business or organization. There was also some reading I did that looked quite specifically at the medical services industry, which kind of is a whole nother level uh, of consent and uh, consent management. Now, the impending reason this becomes so important, certainly within the Australian and New Zealand marketplace, is there's plenty of you, and I can see on the see who's with us today, you're either a satellite office, so you're part of a European or an American organization here in Australia, or you're a domestic Australia or New Zealand business with offices in those markets. Now, if you've got businesses registered in those markets, especially within the European Union, then impositions of things like GDPR become very important. And I'm sure you've hopefully already sort of kind of got on top of that. What we wanted to try and cover off today was looking at some specific ways Eloqua can help. But as we talk about consent management, it's probably also important to understand what it's not and to interchangeably use the word preference management with consent management would be a mistake. Consent management is all about a person providing you with a a yes or a no in relation to capturing their particular personal details. 
And in most of our worlds, that's pretty general. It's first name, last name, email, company name, job title, maybe some geographical questions, et cetera. And then further into the buying cycle, we might ask more business oriented questions, not so much questions that are personally identifiable necessarily. And so if we look at the GDPR legislation, it's very much around that personally identifiable type of information. So however, while preference management, and consent management are two different things, they're both critical parts that generally will work together. And certainly for the Australian New Zealand marketplaces, as we, uh, are lagging behind a little bit with some of this uh, legislation when we compare ourselves with the European Union, for example, then there's some room for us to potentially get ready because it's certainly the opinion of Marketing Cube that these things are not too far away uh, for the Australian marketplace. We just probably need to work out being uh, net zero emitters by 2050 before we can get into preference management. But we'll get there. We'll get there, I'm sure. So... It would be worthwhile, I think, to explore the types of data that we're talking about when it comes to preference and, or sorry, consent management, <laughs> I said it myself, and preference management. So there's cookie-related data. Now, while that cookie-related data is generally not personally identifiable, it is behavioral and does have layers within itself that, that separate a, an unknown individual by name and all that kind of fun stuff, all that personal identifiable stuff with their behavior. Now, the other type of data, and this is probably the more common data for us as Eloqua users, is disclosed data. So think about a form when you present a form, if you have forms on your website where people are entering information. At that particular point right there, that's where we need to be seeking their consent uh, and their opt-in, so to speak, or their ability to then be globally subscribed to your organization. So it's the disclosed data aspect. That's what we want to focus on today. We're not going to be talking too much about cookies. Uh, certainly, as third-party cookies are, are dying um, and are going away, we need to be thinking a lot more about this disclosed data and probably this first-party data. So here's another QR code for you. Again, I think this is the blog I shared with you last month. This was a, a blog prepared by Matt Hemsley, our marketing manager, looking at first-party data and, and that and the loss of third-party data specifically in the context of eloquent users. So I'd encourage you to have a read through that over lunch if you haven't done that as yet. It uh, will certainly be worth your while. So disclosed data we're looking at. So a name, an email address, uh, geographical information, the company I work for, the uh, university that I'm interested in attending or maybe I am attending today. There's a whole range of pieces of information that people will share with you via a form submission. Now, the other piece of information that we have available to us as Eloqua users is digital body language or the behavioral data. So this is things like um, any action that the person has taken across a known asset. So it's a website visit, it's email engagement, form submissions, those sorts of things. And you'll know when you log into Eloqua and you look at either profiler or you look at the contact within Eloqua itself, you can see all of that information together with the profile data. So we've got profile, first name, last name, email, company, those sorts of things. And then we have the behavior that goes with it. Now, the ability to export that digital body language is, is limited and is not really a... Well, there's nothing generally personally identifiable about it. It's only that in your system, it is linked to an individual. That's, that's where I suppose it becomes personally identifiable. But the data in and of itself is not really personally identifiable. But um, that personal data, the information, the profile information, that becomes a different story. So let's keep going. So consent management. There's some language that probably needs to be worked through here so that we try and get everybody on the same page. And unfortunately, certainly not my experience, I haven't seen across the industry any real harmonization around the use of languages like opt-in, globally subscribed, unsubscribed, globally unsubscribed. Some of these are platform terms like Eloqua speak or Marketo speak or Salesforce speak. They're all a little bit different in what they do. If you look at submission data or form submission data that comes into Eloqua, the most 
commonplace for that information to be stored is typically on the eloquent contact, which is a one-to-one -one relationship. So when somebody fills in a form and they tell you they're in Brisbane, and then eight months later, they fill in a form and they tell you they're in Melbourne, then that means they've probably moved, obviously, but the fact that they were in Brisbane is lost is overwritten by the fact that they're now in Melbourne. So the fact the person was ever in Brisbane is no longer visible on the Eloqua contact because it's a one-to-one -one relationship. The data is constantly overridden. And so whenever you look at the contact, you're always looking at the most recent information that is captured and stored about that particular individual. Easily exported as well. As you know, you can go to segments, do a credit filter, look at all the contacts and look at all fields and you can export the whole lot out to Excel should you need to. Now, some data changes over time. And the challenge with that when it comes to consent management is that you generally want to have the original data because the question may come to you from a customer or prospect, well, how did you get my details? How did I get into your system? What you want to be able to do is look at the data somewhere in Eloqua, the custom object is a logical place, but they, you want to be able to go there and look at it and with confidence be able to say, well, on the 23rd of July um, in 2018, you entered our system at 4.15 in the afternoon and it was because you submitted a form called blah, 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 blah and you could have other information with that as well if you wanted to. So if you wanted to be in the position to do as I just articulated, then that's where a custom object will come into play. Now, there are some other bits and pieces that we need to look at in relation to populating that particular custom object, but that would be the most likely place to do it. So I give this to you again, just as a sample from our friends in the European Union. I mean, it's quite generous. They say that uh, you've got a month. So if a customer says to you, I need all of my personal details that you've got stored, you've actually got four weeks to do it under GDPR legislation, apparently. Um, now you can't charge for it. And the other piece that's actually missing from that extract is the information when you provide it to the person asking it has to be in a generally agreed or acceptable format so you can't provide it to them in some obscure random file format that you know it's proprietary to your organization um, so i think excel excel would be probably the most common way to to share that type of data with an individual Okay, so what I want to try and do here is a, an attempt at that harmonization of language. And, and uh, I'm going to kind of repeat this a few times as we go through today. So consent management, we might say, is at the very top of things. This is um, an individual confirming to your organization that they are happy for you to capture and store information about them. Now, if you're in the medical services industry, again, that becomes slightly different exercise and there's you know, mountains of lawyers who can provide advice on that. The one piece of advice I would give you in relation to Eloqua is uh, you know, I'm yet to come up against a brick wall where Eloqua is not able to do what uh, a lawyer has asked from an opt-in and consent management and global subscription point of view. So that's a plus. You've got a pretty powerful and flexible machine to, to manage that process for you. So that's, that's the first piece of advice I'd give you. Now we kind of move into more general Eloqua speak. And so Eloqua doesn't specifically use the word opt-in, but it does use the words subscribed globally. So subscribed globally is something that you'll see in, uh, in uh, on the contact. Uh, you'll also see it in segments where you're able to filter and include or exclude people. This is at the highest level. And when we start to use the term, if I can go, Justin, if I can go back to your example, you use the term subscribed, I think in your question, but we need to be very clear about what we mean by subscribed because the other level of complexity for Eloqua users is we then talk about email group subscriptions. Don't repeat this to anybody at Oracle, but really <laughs> email group subscriptions is all marketing spin, but in a very good sense, let me explain what I mean. The opt-in or subscribe globally is an individual providing their expressed consent to you as an organization to email them information. And so that, that relationship that they've had there is with you as a business, as an entity. Now, of course, it depends on your 
legal definitions and your opt-in language, et cetera, but generally that's what it is. When we come down to email group subscriptions, the reason email group subscriptions are so powerful is it enables you to offer to people the ability to control their experience with you and the type of information that they get from you. So if an individual so, so let's go back a step. If you think about websites that you cruise on a regular basis, uh, whether it's shoes and handbags or thought leadership or whatever it is, many of them, unfortunately, when you click on that link in the footer, it's, it's uh, you know, unsubscribe or opt out, for instance, they may even say manage my preferences, but you get to a page and it's all but not all, all or nothing. Usually what I see is a page that says, oh, why are you leaving us? You know, I never signed up. Um, I, I don't recall ever doing this. It's not of interest to me anymore. There's nothing there to actually save me. I, it's either all or nothing. I have no options. And so from an eloquent comparison, you might, you could balance that with subscribe globally or unsubscribe globally, right? That's what that is. So email groups comes down a level and lets the person click on that link in the footer, arrive at a, a screen that shows them that, you know what, if I don't want to get any more event invitations, I can actually just unsubscribe from that. You may come up with another word, but they can just unsubscribe from that if they want. However, they're really keen on understanding more about uh, memberships. So great, they can subscribe to that. Really, the reason I say it's all marketing spin is what we're trying to do is create a a process uh, that enables people to have more control over how you communicate with them. So instead of just opting out of everything and unsubscribing globally, they can actually control the flow of information from your organization. And so that's where email group subscriptions come in. So typically, if I'm a lawyer, which I'm not, but um, lawyers are typically far more interested in those top two, okay? Because they're the two that are most critical. The email group level subscriptions is all about marketing. It's really just about providing an opportunity for people to stay excited about what it is that you're doing. And if they're less excited about something, well, they can unsubscribe from that particular piece. Okay, now, what if your uh, brand or your company has many brands? So Eloqua can easily manage multiple brands for you. And this can come across in, in multiple ways. So universities sometimes are a really good example uh, or big global brands like GE, which I'll share in a minute. If we look at a, let's take a university, for example. So I'm a university and I have multiple faculties, which is fairly normal. So what is the opt-in process? And I, when I, give my details, I go to the university's website and I subscribe, I, I sign up and I put some information in. What am I actually signing up for? Am I signing up to hear from the university or am I signing up to hear from a faculty? So imagine a university as the master brand and then the faculty is an individual sub-brand under that. There are a whole range of tools available within Eloqua to help you do that because what you might end up doing, and we've seen this with some universities, is they want to provide a faculty-based experience for people. So yes, they opt in to hear from the university, but once they go through and fill in a few more details and maybe they become a student, but you know, largely we're talking pre-student, uh, so these are people looking to explore and study at a particular university, they then want to have a very specific school of engineering experience or a business school experience, etc. And so then when you think about what might happen down the track from an opt-out point of view or an unsubscribe point of view, what is that person actually unsubscribing from? I just don't want to hear anything else from the school of engineering, but I still want to continue hearing from the business school. So this is not an opt-out. This is not a global unsubscribe from the university. It's an email group level unsubscribe from the School of Engineering only. And so that's what we're trying to control. When I thought about this, it, um, the, the big global brand that came to my mind was a GE. Now I've got absolutely no idea if GE actually use Eloqua, I should point out, but they're just that big, big, big brand. So let's pretend GE Electric, the parent company, buys Eloqua. They probably get the Enterprise Edition, which means they get about 10 standalone versions or editions of Eloqua to play with. And they might decide to have one for aviation, one for healthcare, and one for power. So three very distinct websites and three very distinct brands that will all have their own forms and information contained on them. 
where people will be uh, submitting information. So one thing that Eloqua is able to help you with from a branding and deliverability point of view, and I'm focused more on the branding today than the deliverability point of view, is a very specific language around the aviation business, the healthcare and the power business, which would come right down to the way an email looks when it arrives in a person's inbox. So if I've um, subscribed to aviation and also to healthcare, I'm gonna have two very unique experiences with those two particular brands. And so I'm going to see you know, URL names and those sorts of things will be aviation or they'll be healthcare or they'll be power, for example. So the branding and deliver deliverability, it's a really a horrible word, isn't it? Branding and deliverability package within Eloqua, which is an add-on for basic and standard users, I believe, but I think is, is inclusive of the enterprise edition of Eloqua. Jason, I'll get you to jump in and, and tell me if I've got that right or wrong. But Eloqua can manage that for you. So think about opt-ins and um, preference centers that would be quite unique to these three different, I, I was trying to think of three very distinct business units. These, these guys typically have nothing in common, you would suggest. So very different experiences. So a preference center would probably be built for each, subscription models would be built for each business, but it would all funnel back into um, the master account of General Electric as a parent company. So just in relation to branding and deliverability, I'm not gonna read this out to you. I'll let you have a little look at this. Um, this is literally taken from my Oracle support. So it's, uh, the geek factor is a little bit higher on this one, uh, but this just sort of gives you a little bit of an idea of the impact of the branding uh, piece. Um, so basically it's you know, masking links within Eloqua emails and assets to give the appearance of a cohesive brand, okay? Because at the end of the day, what's really happening is you're using Oracle to send communications on your behalf um, and you want people to have a view in all that process that it's really you and it's not Oracle at all. Okay, not that Oracle slipped their name into anything. I mean, the word Oracle doesn't appear anywhere, but, uh, but you can certainly enhance it with some of this branding and deliverability piece. The delivery side of the fence again it does get a little bit more technical with some of these bits and pieces but uh, just again just to make you aware that this is something that is certainly available if it's something that your brand uh, could or should potentially be considering I said to you I'd probably touch on this a few point a few <laughs> a few times and so again I just want to sort of try and illustrate this in, in a way that makes sense and is easy to understand so Steve asked a question from Melbourne Steve's question is globally shared Eloqua. How do we prevent someone in EMEA opting into an Australian email group? Security groups is the question um, or security labels? Yep, so he's kind of answered his own question. Good job, Steve. So yeah, security labels is largely it. Um, so for, an, for a person that's sitting in an Eloqua instance, as in let's say Steve, it's a, a global instance of Eloqua and you've got millions of contacts, et cetera, but you can have security labels. And so security labels mean that certain users can only see certain contacts. A really simple example is let's say, yeah, you're a company with a big instance of Eloqua. You've got Australia, New Zealand, the US, and let's take Germany as an example. So, what you clearly don't want to do is send out emails uh, inviting people to a soiree at Auckland Harbour and somehow include folks from Sydney and Germany and the US. Okay, So the easiest way to eliminate that concern is to not even make those contacts visible to people outside of New Zealand. So the folks in New Zealand will look at Eloqua and it might say you know, 5 million contacts sitting in the database. That's almost the entire population of New Zealand, I think, isn't it? So, yeah. So what the New Zealand folks would see is simply the contacts that are based in New Zealand. Now, an individual contact can sit across different markets if that's required. Yeah, that's very doable. Um, and we have a number of clients uh, who have that kind of setup. So uh, hopefully, and it seemed like you answered your own question, but security labels, uh, Steve, is probably the best way to do it. Um, and I want to go to, and Steve wants to go to the soiree. Well, you can fly to New Zealand, I think now you're in Melbourne, aren't you, Steve? So New Zealand's arms open. They're uh, excited to have you visit. Okay, so people are globally subscribed. So when people come into the Eloqua platform, regardless of how they get there, 
the default action from Eloqua's point of view is that they are globally subscribed or I think specifically subscribed globally. Whether they come in from the CRM, whether you do a data upload, you know, via Excel, or they fill in a form to come into the platform, Eloqua's assumption is that you as a business have the processes in place that have clearly articulated to individuals that they are now opted in to you as a business or as an organization. The next step is for you as marketers to then try and incentivize these people to look at individual subscriptions. So now that they've come, they've given approval to you as a business or an entity, university to talk to them. Now we want to get very specific. Now you'll do that in two parts. You'll base quite a bit of your segmentation on their profile, on what they've told you, and you'll use that as a candidate to get them into a segment. But even better, let's try and get them to proactively articulate to you what they're interested in. So you'll have multiple email groups within your organization. Now, at the very beginning stage, as I just described, they've literally just come into the platform. As far as the email groups are concerned, the default is no status. Okay, so there is no status at that point. And you've seen this when you look at the contact. We'll have a look here in a minute. You'll see that it says no status. What does that mean? Well, over time, what will happen is the no status will change to subscribed. So for example, with the Eloqua user group, if you read the little language at the bottom of our forms, what that is essentially telling you is if you, if you go to our website and subscribe, that kind of hopefully feels like a bit of a no brainer. You're clearly subscribed to the email user group. However, if you just happen to fill in a form to join a user group one month, then you're also subscribed. And that again is articulated in, in our forms, in our language, in the way that we talk to you. And so all of the communications that you get in relation to the user group go out in a email group called the Eloqua user group. And you notice the footer of all of the user group comms uh, has that quite clearly articulated in the footer as well that you're actually subscribed to the, email, the Eloqua user group service, which we use the word service because it just helps it make it a little bit easier for people to understand sometimes. So this is what it's going to look like uh, over a period of time. However, as time goes on, people may make decisions where they want to be unsubscribed. They don't want to get those particular pieces anymore. But notice the big blue circle in the background is still there. So the person is still globally subscribed. Now, what does all this mean? So let's just revisit and recap on those points. So no status. So the reason for no status is that it's telling you that the person has neither subscribed or unsubscribed at any stage. So if you look at an individual who may be globally subscribed within the Eloqua platform, but all of the email groups are no status, that tells you immediately that they have at no point said yes or no. And that's okay, that's okay. What you don't want to do is say no, clearly. Now, if they're subscribed, so if they're subscribed, the person has specifically subscribed to an email, uh, email group at some point. So remember the language you use internally around an email group, externally, you probably want to present that as a subscription. Think of it like a newspaper subscription or a magazine subscription. We've kind of covered preference centers previously, but this kind of all ties in together ever so nicely then unsubscribed. So if they have unsubscribed, then the person has specifically unsubscribed to an email group at some point. Now we have one particular client um, here in Australia and New Zealand actually, uh, who has taken this a little bit of a step further. What they've done, they've linked certain email groups to a main email group. So for instance, if someone subscribes to the email group event, then they've set up a program in the back end to also subscribe that person to webinar events and other types of events. So somebody downloads thought leadership of a particular type, then they're also setting up, they've also got a program running that will then subscribe that person to additional email groups that are like that one. So that's a decision they went through. They felt there was value in doing that. That's, that's cool. It all, it's all supported by a fairly robust preference center that is able to share that information back to the person. So there are several ways that you can go about this whole process. But what does that look like in Eloqua? 
So here's the contact in Eloqua, and you'll notice up in the top right hand corner is subscribed globally. Okay, so from there, if we go a little bit further and we go across to the third tab, which is the preference tab, we're now looking at the email group subscriptions. Okay, so now we're looking at the email group subscriptions. So this is, yeah, this is my contact in Marketing Cube. So you can see that that I'm subscribed as you would expect. You'll see the last change, date and time, et cetera, is all captured there as well. There's a no status there as well. And I didn't have an unsubscribed. I was thinking it was a screenshot. I should have had an unsubscribed, but yeah, it's basically just the buttons on the other side. It's red and it says unsubscribed. If that's where you see that information, then of course you can go into segments and slice and dice on this data and say to Eloqua, Eloqua, bring back everybody who has subscribed to events, for instance, or Marketing Cube College, whatever it may be. So uh, you've got lots of flexibility there in the way that you do that. Um, how would, this is from Melanie, how would this impact integration with our CRM? Eloqua unsubscribes feedback to our CRM and flags a customer marketing as do not contact. I am, I am correct in assuming if someone wants to unsubscribe from an email group, this wouldn't flag anything to flow back to the CRM. Hi, Melanie. Um, this will, of course, depend on your unique uh, integration and implementation of Eloqua in the context of your CRM. Um, typically speaking, though, my experience has been very few customers will take email group level subscriptions uh, back into the CRM. Usually from the CRM's point of view, it's looking primarily at that global level. So that opt-in or that globally subscribed, that, um, and then, then in a CRM where we have do not contact. So depending on the granularity of what, what does do not contact mean, does do not contact mean do not email, do not phone, do not SMS, do not even stop me in the streets. We just need clarification on that. But typically I think what you're implying is probably do not email. So, so yeah, so that those two things can be connected and integrated. So Eloqua will say globally unsubscribed and in your CRM, the do not contact button will be ticked. So the, the integration can absolutely take care of that. But yeah, as for the email group level, so coming down a level, that information rarely flows back into the CRM. Look, I think there's value in it being there. And we're actually in the process of doing it ourselves. Um, there's great value for it to be in the CRM. I think for the CRM user to get some additional insight on exactly what that individual is wanting to hear about and what they've subscribed to. So certainly worth uh, considering, Melanie. I hope that helps answer your question. Okay, so using email groups to manage the subscriptions and potentially custom objects as well. So let's jump in and have a look. So your organization, um, can present things in a whole range of ways. We might use the word opt-in fairly generically. Uh, that's probably more industry language. Um, Eloqua speak, of course, we talked about globally subscribed, more Eloqua language, as I said. But um, once a person is globally subscribed, uh, you've got the ability, as you know, with email groups to set up multiple email groups. Now, of course, that generic term doesn't really help a great deal. So we typically then rename those things so that they mean something uh, to the individual. Now, an individual over time, uh, once they are globally subscribed, will decide to uh, subscribe to in-person events, maybe in webinars and maybe all of these or maybe none of these. But uh, what you want to be able to do is actually capture and hold that particular data. And the smartest way to do that is through the custom object area of Eloqua. When you capture that data, you want to be able to store it somewhere. And you typically want to be able to do it in such a way that it's not going to be overridden. So remember we talked earlier about the, the contact and how the contact is always the most recent information. Remember I said moving from Brisbane to Melbourne, we'd lose the fact that the person was ever in Brisbane because we only have one field called city, and that's populated right now with the word Melbourne. So we lose that information. The nice thing about the custom object is that it can be done in a, in a range of ways. And it's the original is probably the most important from the point of view of the consent management piece. That is that should an individual ask you, how did I come to be in your database? And, and, and 
well, why are you sending me emails? That's a separate question, but how did I come to be in your database? You wanna be in a position to access that information easily and quickly. And you can certainly do that with a custom object. And the nice thing about the custom object is you can export it easily to Excel which from a GDPR point of view and a compliance point of view is something that you definitely want to be able to do. The only thing that really needs to then happen is for your legal team, usually that's the best way to do it, is your legal team to determine what is personally identifiable data so that then the right information is captured and is stored on the custom object and is forever linked to the contact that's sitting within the, uh, within the system, within Eloqua. And because you always want that original data, the nice thing about a custom object is if you wanted to be able to capture not just simply that original uh, opt-in, but you wanted to capture every subsequent form that they filled in, then that could also be stored in the custom object, all linked by the email address of the individual uh, at any particular time. That's probably the best answer uh, for storing that particular information. Now, of course, once it's in the custom object, it potentially could go elsewhere if you have other data platforms that you feel it needs to be shared with, but that's probably a better discussion to have with our uh, support and technical team, probably led by Kartika. But just know that there is an answer to the question and it's not overly onerous. The, uh, the smart solution also would probably be to look at adding a program to your forms so that the Eloqua users are not having to map every single form that they build back into the custom object. If they simply uh, route it to a, uh, a single program, let the program do the heavy lifting and the thinking and all that kind of stuff, as it then takes that form submission data through the program and then parks it into the custom object for you. Because the last thing you wanna be doing is for every single form, having to map it every single time through to, uh, through to the custom object. So another QR code for you, and this one uh, will provide you with some additional information um, that I'd encourage you to have a look at. Okay, so I just want to quickly jump in and show you a couple of things. So again, just looking at uh, the contact within Eloqua. So here you've got your subscribed globally status, and that's the default, remember? If you ever needed to be in a position, you can go to all contact fields and you can do all contact fields both here in the contact, but if you want to export it, the easiest way would be to go into segments, create a, a filter that has a, a, just the, a, the at symbol in an email and that'll give you the entire database if that's what you need. And you can then export that out accordingly, but it's the preferences right here. Now, just be aware that if someone is at no status, so if I click on the edit pencil, I can say subscribe, it's subscribed. If I click on that, it's now unsubscribed. It's actually gray, not red. I think it said it was red before, but you can't go back to no status. Okay, so once you leave no status, the only other option is to be subscribed or unsubscribed. Okay, then the other part of the puzzle, was looking at email groups. So depending on how you configure your email groups, so things like um, we don't use the default Eloqua subscription centers. Uh, we've created our own preference center, which some of you may have visited previously. And so this is basically contact information. This is all email group information. So this is what's triggering the different email groups. And then these are preferences that we capture here or interests as we call them. And so these are actually fields stored on the Eloqua contact. So we have a marketing automation, it's a checkbox on the contact. And if it's checked, it means at some point that, that you have told us you're interested in marketing automation. If at some point you untick that and save the preferences, then it removes the tick from the Eloqua contact. So, and then at the very bottom of that page, uh, you can see the actual opt-in language. So the, the other thing I want to show you just before we finish off here is footers. So I think email footers um, can be given a little bit more thought in relation to what they look like. Now, where are we? Email setup, uh, components, email footers. 
So these are all of the email footers. Now we essentially have decided to run with an email footer associated to each email group. And the reason I like to do that is because I wanted to make sure that it's as clear as possible for an individual who may decide they want to unsubscribe from something. So let me show you. So this is the one that you've received today as you're reminded to attend. So this email was sent to John Smith as part of our Elahoy user group service. Click here to update your details or click here to unsubscribe or manage your preferences. So this one is what takes you to the preference center. That one's just literally updating your details. So change of job title, that sort of stuff. But this is the one uh, that will take you to this preference center. And so you would arrive at this preference center and you've just been told in the footer that it's the user group that you're subscribed to. And you can see here I'm subscribed. So if I want to, I can flick that to unsubscribed, but everything else remains as it is. So that's not an opt out. Okay. Now there'll always be some less than gifted individuals that just can't seem to figure this stuff out. I'm talking about the end user here, by the way. So I, what I've tried to do and what we've tried to do as an organization is make this as clear as possible. Um, from an entry point, we probably are a little bit tougher than most. So if a client or a prospective anybody is filling in one of our forms, if for some reason they choose to not opt in, then we simply won't send them what they're after. We send them to a page that says, hey, it looks like you forgot to opt in. You know, we'd really like to share with you what it is you're asking for, but unless you opt in, we can't do that. And look, I think in the last eight or nine years, I, I think we've had two emails from people saying, well, that's insane. Why do I have to opt in to get that information? I was like, well, we're not a charity, honey. So up to you. But, you know, we're probably, as I said, we're probably a little bit tougher than most in relation to that approach. Personally, I'm comfortable with it. But, um, but if the person doesn't even want to opt in, that's, you know, what value is there for us in that process. So they can always unsubscribe from any of the communications. And that's the point that we make, that they can, you may also update specific subscription topics via the Manage by Preferences link in the footer of all of our emails. So just trying to be as clear and as transparent with people as possible. So we won't have time to get onto the update and there's not that much to share anyway. So uh, that's probably not a bad thing. But um, is there anything else, any other questions? Kate. Kate says, this is a long preference page. How do you, how do you define engagement with it? Oh, KCN says too fast on the code. Okay, KCN, let's see if I can help you. Which code, uh, which code were you referring to? There's that, try that again. Right, well, Kate, it's ironic that you should ask that question because we're literally just in the process of changing it, not shortening it necessarily, but resequencing it. Plus we deliver two different experiences. If you're on our website and you navigate to subscribe, like um, to any of our services, we actually present that page in three separate loads. So a little bit about you, the subscriptions, and then the preferences at the end. Um, however, if you're in an email and you click on unsubscribe or manage my preferences, you're then presented with that page um, where it's one single page. Because we figure, look, 90% of people that probably click on the footer hyperlink to unsubscribe, that's exactly what they want to do. They want to unsubscribe. And we thought, having to load three different pages was probably a bit unreasonable uh, to offer as an experience to someone who's actually just wanting to take a hike. So that's why it's presented like that. Yeah, uh, we, we look, we're, we're re, rejigging it now. So I suppose that tells you that we felt it needed some work. So uh, we'll uh, be working with Emmanuel uh, on that one. So we'll let you know when it's done and you can have a look, tell us what you think. Um, that was it. Okay, KCN, awesome. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We did, uh, we just run marginally over time. So thank you so much as always for spending some time with us. Have a great week and we'll see you next month. Take care everyone, bye-bye.